It's been said that in relationships, every action is met with an equal and opposite overreaction. Let's talk about that today on this episode of Incremental Health Tips. Welcome to Incremental Health Tips. My name is Jared, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Liz. Today, we're going to be talking about conflict cycles and how they can ultimately impact our relationships and cause discord uh, in our marriages and in our friendships and in, you know, which can ultimately impact our mental health. So Liz, just to begin, why don't you take us through what is a conflict cycle? So this is a technique from emotion-focused therapy called the infinity loop. And so it's endless cycles of arguing where it can be hard to pull apart what actually started the conflict. So often it looks like she nags and he withdraws. So she nags and he withdraws further. So a practical example of this could be he forgot to take out the trash. And so when he comes home, she says, why didn't you do it? which has within it an accusation instead of just saying, hey, could you do this? And so he gets angry about the way that she brought it up and then he withdraws. Maybe he takes out the trash, but then he separates himself from her. Then she may feel insecure and say, why don't you spend time with me? Instead of asking for him to spend time with her. And then he withdraws further because he hears nagging like, you're not good enough. So these different things can really be based in emotions of anger or insecurity that don't get addressed because the spouse isn't willing to actually be vulnerable enough to talk about the emotion that's underneath the behavior. Well, and as well, some of these emotions such as anger or maybe resentment uh, really underpin a lot of the distorted thinking that we've been been talking about, like an attitude of of demand, for example. Like one thing when I was in my uh, undergraduate program taking some uh, social work classes, we were talking about how a common family dynamic is a husband might go to work all day and come home and expect the wife who in this particular example is a stay-at-home mother to have the house cleaned up to have dinner ready but maybe dinner isn't ready and so there's this sort of demand or this expectation that because I have worked all day I am entitled to to dinner or whatever the expectation is there but really the the wife has been at home and maybe has had a hard day or a lot of other things that the wife manages. But oftentimes we get kind of stuck in our own heads and don't really consider the other person. And so I I really think that that can underpin a lot of these cycles of conflict in relationships. Yeah. And a lot of times these cycles can start with an assumption that there's some sort of implicit threat within oh, you know, the wife didn't clean the house because she doesn't care about me, or if she cared about me, she would have had things cleaned up when she might have done quite a lot of cleaning, you know, depending on the age of the kids or whatever else is going on in the house that day. You know, she might have had to run the laundry because the kid made a mess of their clothes, and just time gets away from you when a lot of chaos happens. Well, and these issues can actually happen outside of uh, marriage or or uh, re- relationships in, in that sense. It can actually happen amongst friends. I know that uh, oftentimes young adults, when their friends start getting married or having children, their priori- the, there's an obvious evolution of the person's priorities and the ways in which they can spend their time. And so that can actually put a lot of strain on some friendships and and these cycles can kind of happen in in that way where a friend might invite his married friend or friend who just had a kid to go and do something with them but they can't go because of their new responsibilities 
And that might cause some resentment that manifests into some other ways and can kind of start that cycle. But nevertheless, as, as we have an idea of what these conflict cycles are, uh, so Liz, we obviously aren't going to always be aware of what starts the cycle. We're not always going to identify the first domino that falls to start all of this. So how do we stop it if we can't, especially if we can't identify the root cause? Well, these conflict cycles are different than cycles of abuse, for example, which would need a different kind of solution. But the good thing about these conflict cycles is that either spouse can break the cycle. So it just takes one person recognizing what's going on, getting a better understanding of what the vulnerable emotions are in the situation, and then reacting in a different way. So there's usually little hints of what those emotions are by the way that people respond to it. So if one person says, why didn't you do this? And then the other person says, you're never happy with anything I do. There could be that feeling of insecurity there that, you know, they think nothing's ever good enough for their spouse. And so then there could be, you know, frustration, anger, and insecurity all mixed in there that create an angry response. Now, is this the kind, when you say that, is this the kind of thing that you, uh, just observe and then try a different response with these perceived emotions of the other person in mind? Or is this something that you would actually want to approach the other person with and discuss with them? I mean, this depends a lot on um, what the dynamics are. If I'm doing uh, therapy with a couple, then I would draw this out and explain it to them so that they have a visual representation of what it is that's going on. Whereas if I was only working with one spouse on this issue, I would still draw it out with that client, but they don't need to explain it to their spouse. They can if they think it would be helpful, but if you're not really sure how your spouse would react to the information, you can just start by experimenting with different ways of responding to them and see if it gets a different, more desirable response. Well, as well, the other thing is I am not aware of any sorts of conflict or situations that are actually de-escalated by, uh, by telling the other person, oh, you're angry, you're emotional, you're insecure. Like, while some people might be honest about that, it coming from the other person in a way that might uh, be a tone that comes off as maybe uh, have some accusations or, you, you know, it, it, it might not help the situation. And so especially if you're wrong about how you're perceiving their emotions, maybe just trying the responses can provide evidence to confirm or counter what your perceptions are. Yeah, a lot of these things, the way you respond develops over time. So if you've had a conversation before about how your spouse appears angry, then it may work well to say, I can see you're angry right now. But if you haven't had a conversation about that before, it may be a little more unpredictable about how they may respond. Some people may respond well to having their emotions recognized. Others may not. So it, it can be a little bit tricky, but ultimately you have to try something different in order to get a different reaction. Well, or just to take this to a practical example, if you maybe identify that your spouse feels unappreciated with, with something, uh, a way that you could test this out very practically would be to try and find a way to show appreciation for something unrelated to your conflict and see what response you get from there. Or is there any other sorts of examples like that you could give just to help people understand how to apply this? Well, if for the example I used earlier about someone saying that you're never happy with anything I do, if you hear that coming out of your spouse, then it should be an indicator to you 
that you need to be more intentional about pointing out to them the things that you really appreciate and that you think they're doing well. Even if they're not doing something perfectly, just giving them some feedback, hey, I appreciated you did the dishes last night, just to let them know that you actually see the effort that they're putting in. Well, and, and that's another aspect of, you know, in, uh, in graduate school, I, I studied, you know, really the psychology of how to motivate people to perform well. Uh, this would be in the context of the workplace. And feedback is really important. And I think it's, it's important in any relationship. But if all your feedback is, is going to be negative, then that might, depending on the person and their attitudes and their own resilience, uh, that can actually um, not be taken the way it's, it's meant. And so we were always told to preface your feedback with some, some strengths the other person has. So this way, the feedback is understood to be constructive. So it's not just that you're dismissing uh, you know, going back to that cognitive distortion of dismissing the positive. You're, you're not doing that. You're acknowledging the positive, but you're also being honest about the negatives. Yeah, and if the conversation is constantly negative, it can really kill someone's motivation to continue working on whatever the issue is. Well, and if your goal is to try and engage further and work out the issue, you, you certainly want the person to feel as though that's a, a worthwhile endeavor. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today, but if you enjoy our content, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. We really appreciate all the support we've been getting, and we appreciate each and every one of you who share our content and really try to make a difference in these really tumultuous times. We upload new podcast episodes every Tuesday at 11 p.m. Eastern, and on YouTube we upload new shorts videos, just videos that are less than a minute long, with practical mental health insights and tips every day at 7 p.m. Eastern. So until next time, remember that small steps can lead to big changes, and we'll see you next week.